Hi, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of the Delaware Valley University Women's Summit. My name is Sarah D. George, and today I have with me Brandon Campbell. A little bit about Brandon. Brandon combines her passions for communications and diversity to helping businesses build and articulate their commitment to racial justice. The founder of Brandon Campbell Communications, she has worked with clients, including the Philadelphia Eagles and the NFL. Very cool. Drawing on her 15 years of experience managing diversity issues in international education and facilitating diversity and inclusion trainings for educational leaders. Brandon's anti-racism consulting helps organizations create inclusive and high-performing workplaces. Welcome today, Brandon. I'm so excited. I think that this is a very important conversation, especially after, I mean, it's been an important conversation, but I think 2020 really made this something that needs to be talked about a lot more. And individuals such as yourself play such an important role um, in bringing this discussion to workplaces, to individuals wanting to learn a bit more on how they can be a better ally within the um, any sort of workplace, how to understand situations. And also, I think this is a conversation that will also be important to those who have been on the receiving end of potential, potentially problematic experiences in the workplace as well. So did I miss anything in your introduction or did it sound good? It sounded good. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you, thank you for having me for this really, as you said, really important and overdue conversation. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. Long overdue. And I think that bringing this discussion to, you know, the attendees of this summit, but and then, you know, expanding that on, I hope that, you know, as your as attendees are listening, I hope that you're, be, you know, able to take notes to, you know, think about your own experiences, what have you witnessed, what have you experienced, and we can all kind of bring this into our, oh, you know, when we all disperse and when we go back in office and even as we're virtually, this can be something that I think a lot of people can bring, you know, a newfound understanding based on your expertise and what you share today and be able to create this change for, you know, equity, inclusivity, diversity into any business. Doesn't matter if there are three people or there are 300 people. This is a, a very important discussion. So with that being said, let's just dive right into it. Um, some questions that were submitted that I think will frame this conversation, you know, great, you know, really greatly. Um, let's just dive right in. The first question being, you know, why, why are conversations about race at work necessary? Let's just put it all out there. And yeah, get let's, I, I love that start. And I'll, this is a really perfect question to to frame the conversation overall. Mm -hmm. So as you mentioned and alluded to, 2020 was an intense year on a lot of levels and the brutal murder of George Floyd is what really got the topic of race to the point uh, of where it's something that we're talking about more than I've at least experienced in my lifetime. Because of the pandemic, we couldn't ignore it. It was so easy before these murders, police murders were happening, have happened since the founding of the country essentially, but it was very easy to turn away from it. We couldn't do that. And then we had a summer of protests around the world, people scurrying to read books and to inform themselves on things they didn't realize were happening. And I turned my full focus of my work to doing conversations about racism, anti-racist work, because it's an opportunity. It's not, even though I have lived experience that uh, of experiencing racism, that was traumatic. Even though I do this work, it doesn't make it any easier, but we have an opportunity. We've already gone through this really painful process. Why not just, it's already out there. So why don't we do something with it and really move the needle and, and change. And I'm really 
inspired to do this really because it's the right thing to do. But I have two young kids, a three-year-old daughter and a seven-year-old son. And I don't want them to have to have the talk when they have children. And for those who don't know what I'm referring to, the talk is a conversation every Black parent has to have with their children, warning them essentially about how little wiggle room they have to make mistakes because of the color of their skin. The fact that that's a reality for anyone in our society means we need to have as many conversations about race to stop the systems that cause this violence against people's skin from happening. So, you know, George Floyd was murdered by police. Police administration buildings are a workplace. There is no escape from these conversations from workplaces. We also have a really interesting opportunity presented from the pandemic, ironically, to really for the first time since the history of the American, the modern, we'll say American workplace, to stop and evaluate and make changes. It's not a controversial statement to say that the American office culture was created for cisgender, heteronormative white men who had unpaid labor at home to help with their families. Women entered the workforce, people of color entered the workforce. No changes or adaptions were made. Instead, it was up to them to adapt, up to us to adapt, kind of hide our heads, try as best as we could to fit in. That isn't ideal, and th but that is largely what we're dealing with. So it is long overdue to, to change. And that's why we're having this conversation now. That's why organizations overall need to have these conversations. One of the things I find in my work, working with organizations of all kinds, is so many policies and practices have, ha have just been around for ages. And, and this is where the communications part of what I do comes in. When you look at the way things are framed and the way language is used in many of these policies, there are necessarily people included and people excluded. And so when you then review those policies with an eye towards equity, it can be it, and it always is very eye-opening and people say, oh my gosh, well, that's not what we intended. I can't believe we didn't realize this. We are in March now, just off of Black History Month. And before that in January with Martin Luther King Day, I think a really big example is, are you offering Martin Luther King Day as a holiday? And if not, what is that communicating to your employees of color? Is that showing respect? to them? Is it showing that you acknowledge and value their experience? So to, and I could, to kind of wrap up and give a one answer to that question of why do we have to have these conversations? I would say it's because we can't, there is no way in public life in our personal lives to move past an issue if you don't acknowledge it. Acknowledgement has never happened. In the United States, as a country, we've never acknowledged the violent beginnings of the country, the, those realities that have continued, the violent beginnings, especially for Black people and Indigenous people. And we've just tried to keep hiding it under the carpet. That's why it's going to keep coming up until we finally deal with it. This summer was intense. There were weekends I could barely get out of bed. I don't want to deal with that again. So let's just have the conversations now. Wow. And I, I commend you because, as you stated, you have experienced racism. You, I mean, there, without getting into the entire history of the country, as you said, there is just no hiding it and there is there's no way to move forward unless we acknowledge it. But the point I'm trying to make with what I'm trying to say is that you're doing a lot of this work while this is just something, like you said, there were some, we, especially in the, you know, the summer when everything was going on, where it was just hard to get out of bed, but you're still doing the work because you want to make sure that this is acknowledged, that it's implemented, that equity and inclusivity comes through. And especially, like you said, you have children, you don't want to have the talk, um, which is, it's just such a sad 
conversation to have, especially when it comes down to the color of your skin, to say that you do not have this wiggle room. Um, mm -hmm. And just taking that and wanting to make a difference that is, it's selfless for you and it's important work. And I just want to, you know, for, I want to say that you inspire me by, you know, sharing this and being vulnerable and explaining the entire, how, how you came to be in this situation and how you were propelled to move forward and taking your own experience and meshing it together with how you want to see the world move forward towards, you know, equity and inclusivity within the workplace, just being a standard, even down to just, you know, do you have Martin Luther King Day off? And that just in itself says a lot about the company culture and their values, or again, also what you said about, you know, oh, we don't mean it this way in the copy, but the copy is there. It's great when your intentions aren't like that, but here is the tangible copy of what, whatever that P, you know, within the communications or the mm -hmm. bylaws or anything, right? The company, and you don't realize it's like there is how you really, you know, well, we don't mean it by that. This is how it's interpreted, basically. Right. On it's, words. it's intention versus impact. Right. You could yep. have the best intentions, but if it's impacting people negatively, you need to go go back to the drawing board. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I'm going to take that. I think we've both heard this on many ends, this one kind of question that, it, you know, I don't know if people are playing devil's advocate when they ask, but I don't really know the intention sometimes. Sometimes the intentions are there, but the question always is, doesn't talking about race create more division? If we're talking about this and that, this and that, doesn't there, that create a divide? And I think we've both heard that being asked before. Definitely. Whether on online or anywhere else. So much online. <laughs> I know. Uh, it, is, it is one of my, my favorites because there's a lot to dig into. The first thing I would say is there's so much having couched this conversation as, ooh, that's political. I don't talk politics publicly. Shouldn't we have this conversation? That is serving to uphold systems of oppression by telling you that, oh, stay quiet, don't talk about this, don't acknowledge this. I very intentionally call myself an anti-racism, uh, anti-racist consultant uh, because that's about action and ultimately moving towards dismantling those systems. So as Ibram X. Kendi says, there is no non-racist middle. So for me, that entire question is, Ooh, this makes me uncomfortable. Let's not talk about it. So it's really not about being uni unified. It's about white people's comfort. Mm -hmm. And a huge part of this process, if we want to move the needle and have change, is it's going to be uncomfortable. And you have to really sit with that and explore what you feel so uncomfortable about. And there's a quote that I love from Austin Channing Brown that I always use that is being an anti-racist is being a better human to other humans. That is, it's so beautiful on its face. And it's one of the few things in life that really is as simple as it sounds. This is about getting past your discomfort to try to advocate for other people. I think most of us get out of bed already each day and, and think in some form or fashion, I want to do better today. I did this so well yesterday, this not so well, let me do better. This is really the same thing. Uh, and that another version of this question is, oh, well, or, or a response to it is, well, I'm, I'm colorblind. I don't see color. That, if you're watching this, please don't say that. If you've said it, Please don't say it again. I will explain it why. That is saying, since I don't see color, there's no way I can be doing anything wrong. I'm above all of this. We are not in a colorblind society. So if you are choosing to be colorblind, you're trying to find that non-racist middle that doesn't exist. The goal is diversity and inclusion 
difference isn't bad. What's bad is when those differences, when people discriminate based on those differences. So saying I'm colorblind, you're erasing a big part of who I am. I'm a black woman, very obviously. It's a part of my identity that I'm proud of. If you're saying that you're colorblind, you're not acknowledging who I am. That's a problem. And that's what has happened traditionally in workplaces. So the goal is in moving towards inclusive cultures, the goal is to have everyone feel comfortable to be in the space as they are, to show up as they are, however they identify, and to have what's called psychological, psychological safety. So they can show up as they are, know that they can be, they can make mistakes on their team, but that their identity isn't going to penalize them. Moving towards that is really the goal, not just because it's the right thing to do. Research has shown over and over again that truly inclusive teams are those with the highest performance. And think about it, why wouldn't that be the case? If you're not sitting in fear that, oh my gosh, well, I don't like this, but if I speak up, they're going to say that I'm an angry black woman and you know a microaggression will take part or they'll take it out on me in my performance review. When you remove those fears because you've done the work and acknowledged race in the workplace, you're elevating everyone. I agree. I think that that's, and your explanation of that just really proves that conversations need to happen. This isn't, you know, like you said, I don't, I don't see color because like you said, you're erasing the identities of people by saying you don't see color. And again, you're, as you said, there's that, that middle that people try to stay in and it's going to be uncomfortable, it, especially you, nobody wants to be painted, say, I'm not racist or I haven't done this, not me. But the mm -hmm. thing is, is if you try, if you avoid kind of circling back to the first question and the answer you gave, we're again, just pushing this off to the side. We're not addressing it when we say statements like that. Mm -hmm. And it's just prolonging any sort of change towards equity and inclusion that we can have when we say statements like that. And I liked your statement also about the psychological safety, because mm -hmm. I think just in general, if you just take this from the most basic standpoint, you do perform better when you feel safe. And for Absolutely. individuals, you know, that don't feel safe in the workplace because of, uh, um, you know, conversations and situations regarding race, of course, you're not good. You're going to be so afraid to make one mistake or again, you know, anything where you're going to look, have something that might be tied to some form of, you know, even a microaggression towards, you know, a race, like these things come up and that shouldn't be the case. And lastly, mm -hmm. the quote that you provided about being a better person to be better for others, mm -hmm. that's so important too, because when you think about it, everybody wakes up and they want to be, they want to do something different. And they, it, this can be tied into, I want to learn a new skill, or I want to do this, or I want to lose weight. And it's like, well, why can't we take that same energy towards bettering ourselves yes. to, to better other people? Because it's not like this is some idea that we don't wake up with every day for our own personal lives. Right. But again, when it adds the discomfort of having to admit that there is white privilege, there's a lot of things that we just do not think about, or we don't want to say, oh, we're not a part of of that, you know, this leads to that idea of like, well, if you want a better, why can't we take that same energy towards even, even if it is just, we have to admit some things, we have to look within ourselves and feel discomfort and have to sit and listen and implement or not, and sometimes not say anything and just listen to the people yes. who are telling us about a situation and not fight back and say, oh, well, not me. Mm -hmm. that's really important because it is something we think about every day but we need to, like, putting that energy towards others and making the world better for other groups of individuals or you know say somebody in your own workplace that you might be yes. noticing this all instances so i don't want to drag that out any longer but i want to get to the next question because i'm learning so much but i just wanted to throw that in there that sharing that i think is so important for those listening, for myself, anybody out there that is learning and wanting to um, have a better idea of how to, you know, be a better individual for others. 
So now question for uh, maybe again, carrying on from that last statement and individuals that might be like, well, not me, I haven't done this, but what do I do if I've been accused of doing something racist by a colleague? Something, it, it could be something as outward as a racist comment to a microaggression in which maybe they didn't know. And now they're like, well, I didn't know I was doing this. So mm -hmm. how would you, how, or how would you go about? So that, that ties in with something you said a few minutes ago about um, how important it is to listen. So I'll address that in a couple of different ways. The first way being, I have certainly been in the position where I've had to raise to a supervisor's attention something like um, discrepancy in how, what I'm allowed to do versus others who identify as white in the workplace or language used, you know, very disrespectfully and just setting the, the expectation that that's not, a, that wasn't appropriate. Here's why. Let's move forward. So, you know, it may come to you. You may be accused in a way that's maybe not saying, hey, you're racist, but in that sort of way that I mentioned, something's different in the way you're treating me. Hey, I've noticed this. Can we have a conversation? So much of why this is hard, and I always acknowledge, and I, I did at the beginning of our conversation, there is so much emotion involved on all sides. So we have to, rec we have to recognize that. And just listening, I would say we need to do a whole lot more of. Rather than what we do a lot as Americans is we listen to respond. We've been accused, so we're defensive. We're not letting the person tell their side of the story, their experience. And by doing that, we're discounting that experience. Think about how vulnerable that person is by coming to you, especially if you are in a position of power and coming to you sharing this experience. So honor that bravery and honor it and respect your colleague by practicing active listening. It's hard. Some of it involves body language. When we, even when I was giving the example, I, I tensed up. So I tell people, really be conscious of how your posture is. Put your shoulders back and down. Really try to relax. And you can nod, nod to indicate that you're, you're there, you're with them, but let them speak. Let them share their experience. Because if you are working to completely discount the reality of this person's experience, you're not gonna get anywhere. That doesn't work. You're not getting to psychological safety. You are in fact putting that person in a traumatic situation and creating a toxic environment for them. So the first thing I would do is say, drop your defenses. It's hard to do, but it is critical. Listen, so much of, there are so many parallels between what we do in our, our own lives. If you think of, of disagreements you've had with friends or your partner, you know, just that kind of bickering back and forth, has that resolved anything for you at any time? Yeah, probably not. So you can't, it's the same thing here, it's the same principles of what's going to work in terms of how we communicate. Um, and that's really important. And so much of that defensiveness is about shame. Automatically, feel, oh my gosh, well, I'm not racist. That can't have happened. We need to work really hard to try to re remove shame from the process. I know that's far easier said than done. Acknowledge that that's part of your feeling. That's very much part of the experience. It's part, it's part and parcel with that discomfort. But, you know, I'm a huge Brene Brown fan. Shame doesn't help. You'll start to get into a shame spiral. And then in trying to defend yourself really to yourself, you're going to take that out on someone else. If you take the feedback, there's this idea of failing forward that you may have heard about. If you, failing is hard. So when I tell people that this work means you're going to make mistakes, ooh, people don't want that. But 
when someone is presenting you with this, look at it as an opportunity. They are telling you, hey, this isn't working. You are getting a free lesson in how to be a better human to other humans. So look at it that way. The only way and the only reason you should feel shame is if you're presented with that opportunity and you do nothing with it. When we know better, we do better. If you choose not to, then yes, I think you should feel ashamed. But if you're even watching this presentation, I don't think that that's you. I think you're wanting to know how to do better. So you can't feel shame about what your ancestors did, what you did last week when you didn't know what was wrong. What's important is what are you going to do now and how are you going to move forward? I think that, like you said, failing forward, that's such a strong idea in this. It's hard, especially when you're hearing, oh, I've done this, you know, and sometimes people are like, I've been doing this for so long. I didn't know that this was a problem for, for things that are much smaller and not smaller, sure. but maybe not at the more subtle, I should say, subtle ways in which, um, racism kind of permeates, even if it's not something, because I think we've had this kind of concept of like, racism is this, it, but yes. racism is also, again, these little microaggressions that you don't, that you may not even know that you're experiencing or not you're experiencing, but you're putting forth in how you um, act with others in the, you know, the workplace. And again, how this person gets treated differently than this person. And it's quite obvious that there, there's a, there is racism more or mm -hmm. less that is happening even if it isn't outward, it still is subtle. And you're saying, well, I'm being treated differently than this person. Let's talk about it. And then again, failing forward and then feeling that, that shame. And I think that that really comes in, as you said, with that defensiveness instead of just listening. And I agree if you, if you get this free advice and then you don't take it and you don't learn from it, then shame can come in. But as long as you're listening and taking things in and wanting to do better, I think that that's a good first step in getting individuals to create a more equi equitable and inclusive workplace. So I don't think that there should be this immediate defense. There should be, again, the listening, taking it all in and seeing how one can, going back to the doing better and like building upon oneself to be better for other people out there. So I think that that's absolutely important information. And again, I'm, le I'm learning so much and thank you for sharing. And I know there's probably people watching right now that are just like, okay, I hope people are taking notes and I hope that this is something mm -hmm. where Pete, the wheels are spinning for attendees. So. so. Lastly, I think this, this is a nice way to sum up this conversation. What's one thing that I, we, anyone can do to be a better help to build more trust and understanding, especially with colleagues of marginalized groups? Okay. And that's, I love that question because the, the acknowledgement and moving to awareness is really critical but I've seen since last summer, people are really stuck in that awareness phase. Mm -hmm. They are reading the books, but they're really stuck. They have no idea how to move forward. So I'm gonna slip in a little more than one thing. That's <laughs> uh, fine, that, just slip in whatever you need. Um, so I think that listening piece is huge. I think everyone listening to this conversation should start practicing that at work, at home. You'll realize how hard it is, which means it's been something we, we've we grown out of. It's so ironic because I, I mentioned I have young kids and I talk to them about listening. So often we don't do practice what we preach. So really listen and value the experiences of anyone in your world. The other thing I would say is to continually ask yourself, especially if you identify as white, this would be a whole other, I mean, you could get a graduate degree in this topic, but I, I'm, the notion of white privilege, that's something else where people get very defensive. And it's not saying that you've had an easy life, but it just means in the challenges you've experienced, your skin color has not been one of them. So it's really important to start to change the way things are done, move the needle and ultimately change systems 
for people who um, are not from marginalized groups to use their privilege to leverage opportunities for others. So that can take place in so many ways. And I think the question to always ask yourself is who's at the table and who's not here that should be here? Who are we including in this conversation? Who are excluding? Who are we excluding? So if a meeting takes place at work and you know a colleague who is, you know, a black man is leading a project, but then there's a meeting and he's not a part of it, call that out like, oh, hey, Sam isn't here. Should I go get him? Let them know that this isn't okay. If there are events that your workplace puts on, look at the panel of speakers. If it's all white, say, mm, could we do something here to represent a little diversity and experience? If you have any leverage with, uh, if you work in the business office and you work with vendors lists, are there any businesses owned by black or indigenous people? That is a huge way to move the needle forward. Um, and, and I would really stress the really, mm -hmm. your skin color gives you privilege in the workplace to be privy to conversations where there may be some coded language and maybe they're not saying we're being racist, but they're saying we're being racist. So insert yourself, don't let that happen. Don't be part of the non-racist middle. You'll have to have strategies to address it. Um, you'll know the people and the personalities of those you work with you know, better than anyone, but call it out. Let them know in my presence, this is not gonna be okay. This is, you know, I am here for myself, but also I want everyone on my, my team to be able to thrive. So I think that's one, if you take any, well, I've said that about many things, but <laughs> one of the things that if you take away, be an advocate, which is really what that word means. Ally, be a co-conspirator, uh, co really leverage the opportunities you have as, a, um, as an ally to advocate for others. It's something where when you actually take in, when you put this into practice, it's not that difficult. Again, like you said, if there is somebody that isn't in the room, where mm -hmm. are they? Let's bring them in. Or, hey, I'm looking at this panel and it is a very, very white panel right now. Can we have a little bit of diversity? Mm -hmm. Things really do not take that. It takes the discomfort, as you said, but the, from the discomfort of somebody who is an ally or who is trying to put those people at the seats at the table, that little discomfort will pay dividends down the road. And going back to that psychological safety, yes. having this inclusivity, making sure that there is somebody there that's like not on my watch, like this will not be happening. This, that in itself, again, making that not pushing this conversation aside or being in that non-racist middle, being that one person can create such a better work experience. That one person can allow marginalized communities to rewrite what whatever the wording is in a document that isn't intentionally being racist, but is racist. They could be the mm -hmm. person that stops the microaggressions, that brings these people to the table and... For anybody that is listening that is not part of a marginalized community, like this can be you. And like we're taking what Brandon is saying and even starting with one thing in which you can do, bringing somebody into the conversation and continuously doing that. It's, I would say, a muscle that we all have to flex and continue to grow. And at one point, hopefully, it'll be less of a discomfort and people will be okay to sit with that discomfort because they've done it before and they can do it again. So I just wanted to throw that little bit out there for anybody that's taking notes that it's, it's, it will be uncomfortable, but this is work that needs to be done and a conversation that I'm so lucky to be listening, but also having with you. And I, I wanted to say that I just want to note that it's a, a privilege of mine to be able to listen and learn from you. And I've learned so much. Mm -hmm. I think you're a wonderful individual and I respect you so much. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Sarah. Of course. Well, 
Um, before we sign off from this, is there anything else you want to add? Any last minute, you know, thoughts before we leave? Or do you think we're, do you think that this has a nice little bow on top of it? <laughs> Just one last thing to remind yourself it is, all of this is overwhelming. This is a marathon and not a sprint. The problems weren't solved, weren't created in, you know, in just two days, we can't change them in two days. But exactly as you were pointing out, Sarah, if you start to exercise, to flex this muscle and to practice, you'll be teaching the people that you work with to think about they may honestly not have been thinking about, oh yeah, why didn't we invite Sam? Oh yeah, why isn't there someone here? You're going to be having change happen around you. And if, if you just think of just if 25% of the population said, I'm gonna do this within my social circle, you'd really start to see change. So it's a huge problem, but know that it starts with just the smallest things, just your interactions and being that better human for other people. So um, it is a challenge, but it's really an opportunity. And I hope that you look at it that way as you move forward in this work. Thank you so much, Brandon. I think that that was just a great way to end this conversation. So please, anyone, watch this video, pause it, take notes, see what you can do. And if you are on the end where you have been on the end of having received a microaggression or anything like that, I hope that this conversation also was a benefit to you, you know, to hear this, this conversation and be able to know that that this conversation is being put out there to make, to have people be better for other people. And I thank you all for listening in. And thank you again, Brandon, for sharing your knowledge and expertise. Hope you thank have- Thank you again. Day. Thanks for watching.